Welcome to the Canes Insight Baseball Podcast, powered by Anajar and Levine Accident Attorneys. We got Mr. Perfect himself, Javi Salas, co-host of the Great Bullpen Mafia, some viral quotes with Dontro Willis. Josh Beckett telling him to give him his ring size before Beckett went to close out the series. More great stories. Like and subscribe to that podcast. It is essential. But today we are talking about the bread and butter, Canes Baseball the team is now on campus. We got numbers, we got pictures, we got names and faces. We'll be talking about that. We'll be talking about what it's like to be a player in this time of the year, earning your stripes. And then also, of course, Adrian Don Castillo, what he's doing with the majors. But first, a word from some of the best friends that Canes Baseball has. This episode of the Canes Insight Podcast is brought to you by our friends at Sala Astorita and Cox, a boutique law firm focusing on securities regulatory matters broker-dealer and investment re advisor regulation, white-collar criminal defense, complex commercial litigation, and securities arbitration and litigation. The firm aggressively represents clients throughout the na nation. Contact them now at 561-989-9080 or visit them online at salalaw.com. All right, Hav, it's officially begun. We're seeing pictures. We got a roster. We are uh, We're in business. Or I mean, it's 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 that time of the year, D. It's it's definitely the best time of the year to be a Canes fan all around. We got the Gators coming up in what is it nine days from now? So um, definitely a welcome sight to see the the Canes baseball players on campus. I'm sure, just like I am, they're all looking forward to August 31st as as much as anyone. But um, you know, to your point, we got pictures, we got a roster, and an unofficial roster. I think of the fall roster has at least been released on on the website. So folks can go check out who is on campus, what number they're wearing. Um, you see the photos that that we're sharing here now. Got guys with their first day of school, but uh, definitely an exciting time on campus. Now, unusual in terms of the size of the roster, right? So we're talking about 42 players on the roster. It needs to get down to 35. Is that a dynamic that you have any experience with at all? And how do you see that playing out in terms of just the dynamics of the team? Yeah, no, I, I, in, in my four years and I think in the time, you know, the 10 years after now, I haven't seen a roster as robust as the one we currently have, 42 names. And obviously, you know, you start to think about, hey, you know, roster sizes are increasing. The, the scholarships are finally flooding. NIL money and baseball is like I've, I've been harping on is having its moment. But we haven't seen a roster like this at the University of Miami. I think some of the other public schools, you look at Florida, Florida State, they usually look something like this, but, you know, between 40, 45 guys in the fall. By the time season rolls around, they'll cut back to 35. But at the University of Miami, I have not seen a roster of this size. Um, it's certainly going to lead to an extremely competitive fall. Um, I know on these pods, we've talked a whole lot about the roster turnover. We've talked about names exiting, a bunch of names that have entered um, onto this roster. We saw a coaching staff that was extremely aggressive in the portal. So, again, that leads to 42 guys in the fall. I expect a super competitive, super, you know, it's, it's going to be it's going to be an absolute grind. And I think that that's exactly what you want coming off the season that they just had. Now, just put us in your shoes. I'm, I, you were a fall enrollee, right? I was. Fall, yep, yep. yep. So that process of enrolling or coming back, whatever, it isn't to be a freshman, but just getting to campus and then getting started with baseball uh, and, and practice starts in October. But I'm sure they're doing stuff now. What is that process like? What are we looking at as far as just the day-to-day -day of a Canes baseball player at this time of year? Yeah, so I think I think there's two different ways to look at it. As a freshman, it's certainly like drinking from the water. I mean, the fire hose, right? You're coming in and you're really green. A lot of these guys haven't been in, you know, such an intricate training program and weightlifting program, conditioning program, as they're going to get into in the next couple of days and weeks. You know, the first – leading up to that first official fall practice, it's a whole lot of conditioning, a whole lot of running, weightlifting – there's some stuff on the field that's in much smaller groups. The coaches can't necessarily be around as much as they will be in the back, the back half of the fall. But it's a great time to get to know your teammates. Um, look, it's the first time a lot of these guys are going to have to deal with a full class schedule, study hall. They're waking up in the morning to lift. There's post-practice lifts and runs. So it's a full day full of responsibilities. As a freshman, you're definitely, you know, you feel that. And it's a great sort of get to know you process. You meet some of the older guys. Guys take you under their wing, I think. That's one of the things that Miami has really been known for is having a great mentorship program. A lot of the older guys in this particular year, you have so much roster turnover. It's like you're getting, you know, 20 something new freshmen, right? Not only do you get the freshman class, but you get the portal class coming into the University of Miami their first time. They're all getting to know each other. So, I mean, this is going to be a fall of 
a tremendous competition, but a fall of rebuilding the culture of the program. And I think that that's probably more important than anything is understanding that, hey, we did not have a good season last year. It was not up to the Miami standards. For all intents and purposes, one of the worst seasons we've had in a long time. And, you know, you want to make sure that the culture in this group, this nucleus of players understands that and goes into the next season. That that won't happen again. You know, having the mentality that we'll never let that happen again. When do you expect, I know this is a new thing, people to understand who, what the cuts are going to be. Like, how does that whole process work? Do you have any, I mean, again, I know it's not a situation you're used to dealing with at the, at the college level just because of the roster size. But, like, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, look, I, I think, you know, the roster dynamics are certainly going to be different. Not something that I've necessarily experienced, but all falls are competitive. And, and whether it's, you know, cutting down a, a big number, which they're going to have to this year or in the past where it's a smaller number, there are always cuts. And it's, you know, sometimes self-inflicted. There's, you know, we are in Miami, D. It, it, there's a lot of temptation. You know, the Grove on Thursday night is, you know, a couple miles down the road. I, I remember, you know, very fondly when my freshman year, we had a senior that was like, you know, there's basically three things that you can do. It's baseball, there's school, and there's partying. And you can really only do two of the three. So, like, guys got to make decisions early on, and you hope that, you know, you have a good enough group that understands, hey, we, we want to have a competitive fall. We want to, you know, work towards a certain goal. And, you know, you focus on the important stuff, which is the baseball and school, especially early on. But there are going to be cuts. There are going to be, you know, instances where the coaches are probably going to have to, you know, multiple guys at important positions where, the numbers just don't make sense. And there's going to be some attrition. There always is. Like I said, whether it's self-inflicted, whether it's poor performance, or whether it's, you know, some other reason, there's going to be a roster size down by the time we, you know, talk about the same, you know, roster construction before the spring season. Now, from a physical standpoint, skill development standpoint, what is happening just baseball-wise between now and early October when practices start? Yeah, I, I think at, at this point, you really want to understand what your roster looks like. Again, there's a lot that goes on beyond the baseball that you can't really quantify the weightlifting program. You're going to see guys' bodies change basically overnight because they're, again, lifting four to five times a week. They have, you know, uh, nutrition plans. They have all this at their disposition where they didn't have that perhaps at their previous school or, or in high school. I know I certainly didn't. I remember I got to University of Miami and I was like, holy crap, like I got to keep up. I got my protein intake, all this different stuff that you're trying to do just to keep up to play with some of the sophomores and juniors who had been in this program prior. It's, it's again, drinking from the fire hose. But what you're trying to see from a coaching perspective is, A, let's evaluate the talent that came in. So you really want to get a good understanding of the freshmen. Where do they need the most help? Where can we step in? You know, whether it's swing mechanics, pitching mechanics. Um, again, a lot of it's just going to be from the weightlifting standpoint. Guys need to put on muscle, they need to bulk up. The physicality of an 18-year-old and a 21-year-old in college looks completely different. Again, we've had, you know, great training programs in high schools, but it's never the same until you walk into that door in high school and, and at the collegiate level and realize, like, this is what it takes to be an everyday player at a, at a Power Five school. Again, we have a new strength coach, so there's a lot of new moving pieces. I think from the staff standpoint, number one, let's get an understanding of what's on our roster. Number two, where can we step in and start the developmental process? And number three. Who are the guys who need the most help and who are the guys that are more ready to play? Let's try and, you know, divide those into two different camps at this point. In terms of like the, the transition from September to October, right. And pra actual practices, what changes, like what are they doing then that they're not doing at this exact moment? Yeah. So I think the, the biggest change is, is games, right? You're at, at this point in the fall season, you're not playing any games. There's no nine inning scrimmages. There's no, you know, not necessarily facing live pitching. The pitchers are kind of, you know, ramping up a lot of long toss programs, um, bullpen, side work. You'll see a lot of, you know, infielders taking their ground balls, not necessarily in game action, but taking ground balls, working at different positions, outfielders catching their fly balls. Again, the weight lifting program is all separate. Everybody's going through that. The hitters are going through, again, an evaluative process. You're going to see Coach Fenster, uh, Coach Brewer, whoever it may be, just trying to understand, hey, let's get as much data on these guys as possible, understand where they are now, where we want them to be in six weeks when games start. And then when the games start, you kind of let you know the wheels fall off. This is like this is like a very a very spring training like approach where you want to get guys as many at bats as possible come October, because again, you lose guys for six weeks in the winter. Miami, the University of Miami has a a longer spring, uh, you know, winter break than a lot of schools, right? We come back usually around Martin Luther King Day, whereas some of the in-state schools come back a little bit earlier. So you want to make sure you get guys a ton of at-bats, make sure that they're feeling good going into that spring season. And it's just never long enough, right? Especially with a roster this size. I think one of the 
the more intricate things that we're going to have to work out, or excuse me, the coaching staff is going to have to work out is getting everybody the at-bats that they need. Um, you know, unfortunately with 42 guys, it's just not, not, not enough for everybody, right? There's only one field. There's only a staff of, you know, five or six on-field coaches. There's not enough for everybody. So you got to really start digging into who needs at-bats, where are they going to get their at-bats, and how are we going to structure scrimmages in a way that everybody gets exactly what they need going into the spring season? Now we've seen obviously freshmen blow up here at, at the University of Miami in recent years. Talk about Cuve this year, Sear last year, Nick Robert, not to that degree, but somebody who was maybe lower on the totem pole and ended up playing a big role. Of course, we'll talk about Adrian Del Castillo in a minute and uh, the pros, but he was like that when he came in. How quickly do you know? from your experience just and just being around baseball that somebody has it. Yeah, look, and, and I'll, I'll give my experience in terms of when I was at the University of Miami, right? I came in with, with Brian Radzewski, who was a Friday night starter as a freshman, which is almost unheard of at the University of Miami. Obviously, the Friday night role is so coveted. It's usually the best pitcher on your staff, best pitchability, best stuff. You got to go out and win a game on Friday. That's who you're sending out there. And Brian Radzewski was that guy for us. And it was in such a way, I remember as a freshman for me, I'd never really been in a, train, in a strength program. I was, you know, working from behind. It felt like the whole entire season. Whereas Brian came in and he was ready to go dialed in, not necessarily from a weightlifting standpoint, from, from a baseball standpoint. His baseball IQ was so high. And I think that's what separates guys at this level was how do you, like, what's your level of baseball IQ? You see it with a guy like Daniel Cuvet last season, right? He was basically a one-man wrecking ball the entire season, right? He didn't have protection from Torres and Sear at the end of the year. He does just fine. It's because he knew, hey, I understand what pitchers are doing to me. I understand how they're trying to pitch me. I'm going to get my pitch to hit, and I'm going to do damage when I do get it. So I think the separators, the IQ level, again, the weightlifting, the nutrition, all that stuff comes at you, and it's all coming fast. But once you get into game mode and the games that matter, the baseball IQ level is what separates those freshmen. You saw it with Cuvay, Del Castillo with his monster freshman year. Blake's here, just to name a few of freshmen that have had impact recently at the University of Miami. Now, let me ask you about scrimmages, because this has always kind of been interesting to me. I never I never played. Now with my son playing travel, little kids, I see parents complaining about their kids pitching in scrimmages. So I'm trying to imagine, you know, these are guys that are potential pros, like a guy like Lasco Yero, who he, he turned down the pros. Uh, some of these guys have aspirations to pitch in the pros as early as next year. How does that work in terms of pitching in these scrimmages preserving your arm at the same time, showing what you can do. Yeah, look, and, and I think there, there's there's so many different schools of thought with preserving pitching that I think it's gotten to the point where you almost preserve it too much. And then, you know, guys get injured when they do have to ramp up and the intensity and the velocity, right? I think what we're entering an era of, of baseball at, at every single level where people are throwing harder than they ever have, but throwing much less than they have in the past, right? I think what, what you saw Major League Baseball try and implement, which was, you know, broadly decimated a couple of weeks ago was, a six inning limit or a six inning threshold for starting pitchers. And everyone scoffed at it, said it was ridiculous, but there's some truth to it, right? Because I think we've become so desensitized to pitching and, and, you know, limiting and, and throws and, and all these, all these different metrics that are out there. But at the end of the day, guys got to go out there and pitch. They have to perform. And I think the only way you can do that is by pitching and scrimmages. You have to ramp up your body has to get, you know, we, in, in the minor leagues, we call them up and downs, right? You go up onto the field, you come down and sit down, you know, when your team is hitting. So, you want to go up and down four or five times. You want to go up and down six times so that you can get ready for, you know, the workload of a full season. There are going to be a couple guys, and, and you know, I know we're going to talk about this, but there are a couple guys who have sort of been penciled into starting roles that they got to ramp up, right? A guy like Brian Walters, who was maybe injured a little bit last year at the end of the season. If he's going to be a starting pitcher, you got to ramp these guys up. So what you want to get out of the scrimmage is, A, a super competitive environment. You want to make sure that the game simulates a a baseball environment of, you know, a Friday night at Mark light. It, it'll never simulate that, but you have to, in your mind, you have to think, Hey, this has to be my Friday night game. I'm going to pitch five innings. I'm going to get up to 85, 90 pitches. Granted, we might not see that workload in the fall, but once spring comes around, it's a quick turnaround. The season starts. You got to be ready to go. Well, it's just in terms of visualizing this, a guy like Gabe Zeal last year, he's living in the 92 to 95 range. What's he throwing in a scrimmage in October? Yeah, look, a lot of it, D, is is, is adrenaline. Um, I know for me, I could never replicate the feeling of pitching in a real game. Obviously, in a scrimmage environment, a controlled environment, it's not necessarily the 100%, you know, and adrenaline level you're probably going to get on a Friday night at Mark Light Stadium. But there's still that level of competition. Look, 
the keeping score, if you're playing a game and, and somehow the outcome is going to be determined, win or loss, you definitely want to put your best forward. So you're going to see really competitive scrimmages. And I think in a, in a fall season, like we're about to enter with 42 guys, that, that intensity is going to ratchet up, especially coming off. Look, you come off a tough season. What do football coaches always say? Like that, that summer camp, that training camp after a bad year is tough, right? Everyone goes through hell. I think Aaron Rodgers said it the other day, the Jets camp has been absolutely miserable and it's probably because they sucked last year. Right. So I think you can, you can sort of bring that level of intensity, ratchet up, have guys understanding, Hey, there's, there's six or seven jobs on the line here. Guys might not be around tomorrow. If you're not, you know, performing at your best level, you're going to see that intensity and in scrimmage ra ratchet up. It might not be, you know, gauge zeal throwing 94, 95, but you're going to get the bulldog gauge zeal come out in, in certain instances where you're like, okay, this guy, this guy's bringing it today. I got to make sure I bring and match that intensity. Great segue. Cause I want to ask JD Arteaga did an interview with, with Chris stock over two, four, seven, and a lot of interesting quotes in there. I won't get into the whole article, but you know, one thing he talked about was it, the, you mentioned the, the, competitive nature of the whole off season because of the cuts that you mentioned he said the scoreboard's always on i know what you said uh, but he method figuratively and literally i mean basically everything is being evaluated he also said there's 20 pitchers going for four spots in terms of the starters and i'm sure that's not you know there might be coach speak in other instances but here you couldn't name the three or the four i mean it's it's it, at least i couldn't and i don't think you can and you fall as closer than anybody around so Looking at this roster, I'm seeing Nick Robert, who J.D. mentioned as a starting pitching candidate, of course, who was Miami's closer last year. Carson Fisher from Davenport, uh, D2, but, or D3, I'm sorry, but was, but was a starter. Griffin Hugus, who pitched four or five innings in the Cape, a pop towards the end, and was was really impressive there, could potentially be a starter. Reese Lumpkin, uh, a starter from Winthrop. Um, Alex Giroux, a starter from Hawaii. Talk about Laz Collero and A.J. Siskar, two guys that they have high hopes for as young starting pitchers. Brian Walters we talked about, and we'll talk about a little more. J.D. was explicitly saying that he's going to be in the mix for starting uh, as a pitcher. So a lot of these guys have starting experience. They are. It's. I know you, you like to say everybody's a starter when they get to high school, but these guys are – some of these guys started in college last year or were draftable guys like a Collera. So – how does that competition feel different this year? Yeah, look, usually, uh, I mean, we, we ended up last. Let's just look at last year's, right? We had Gage Zeal penciled in as Friday night. So you knew there's one less spot. You had a Rafe Schlesinger who came on at the end of 2023, who was, you know, going to the Cape, pitched well in the Cape, was sort of being groomed as a starting pitcher. You had Herrick Hernandez who was kind of your wild card. We, we didn't really know what to anticipate. But, again, you had an idea of two to three guys who kind of fit the bill of that starting role. You know something that JD mentioned in that in that 247 article, they didn't really get a frontline starter ace, bona fide ace in the transfer portal. They accumulated a lot of pieces, they brought in a lot of depth, they brought in a bunch of guys who they're gonna throw into the fire in the fall and say, Hey, there's four starting spots up for grabs, there's a bunch of spots in our bullpen up for grabs. Go and get them and go. You unleash them. You say, Hey, these are these are experienced guys too. D they, they've been in fall camps, they've been around, they understand what's at stake here. Granted, they haven't been at the level of the University of Miami, but Griffin Hugas just, you know, had a two-something ERA in the Cape, right, which is by all intents and purposes the best summer league in, in the entire country. So you look at a guy like that, he's going to come in hungry. You have a guy like Nick Robert, Brian Walters, who were mentioned in that article, who are sort of the incumbents that might get the first look. But, again, if guys start wowing you, it's a good problem to have, right? You have this competition, this open competition, where you say let the cream rise to the top, understand – there are four starting spots, but how many times have we seen four starting pitchers carry the way throughout the season? It just doesn't happen. Injuries happen, roster fluctuations. If I'm JD, I get as many starting pitchers as I can ready to go, see who the best guys are. One thing that they did address very well this year in the, in the portal was, hey, we have a ton of, of middle relief and bullpen depth, which is going to help elevate some of those games. Right? The I keep mentioning Miami had such a difficult time in the middle relief area getting the ball to – Walters and Robert and Kaba at the end of games. Now you have a bunch of experienced guys from you know the G5, D2 levels that are going to come in and slot in, in those in those roles and bring a ton of experience getting the game to the seventh, eighth, and ninth inning. So again, a good problem to have. Granted, they didn't address the frontline starting pitcher role, but who knows? Is Griffin Hugus one of those guys? Is Brian Walters, Nick Robert? There's going to be options. JD's going to JD and Coach Gutierrez are going to have the ability to run these guys out there and let them compete for roles at a very early, early portion of the fall. 
Yeah, yeah. I talked to Lance Roffers. Uh, you know, both of us know who he's very analytical. He's out there in Missouri, so he sees Missouri State and that and that program. He sees college baseball as a whole, of course, follows the Canes closely. And one thing he always talks about is the name of the game is getting to that middle relief as an offense right. because you put up so many runs so fast with the way the ball's flying out of the park and with the way these guys are hitting with these bats. So it's it's interesting because you have a team here that's strong in that area on paper. You look at the professional ranks, those middle relievers, they'll I mean you can't do anything against those guys. Yeah. Like, you want to hit, you want to get the starter towards the, the end or get jump them early because these once you get to these guys, you're cooked. So it's 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 interesting. You as someone who follows both games very closely, how at least from the outside, it seems like it's kind of the inverse. Yeah, look, in college, you're just hampered by roster, right? Your, your, your best starters are going to be your your weekend starters, your Friday, Saturday, Sunday. You're going to leave your best one of your best power arms as your closer. Unfortunately, just a lot of teams don't have the ability to run out seven, eight, nine deep, right? I think, in, and you look at the teams that went to Omaha, they do have that ability. They do have guys that they trust to get, you know, six outs in the middle of a game, get, the, get their starters out of some hairy situation, pitch with runners on base. I think, you know, you mentioned it, but – Something I, I've said on this show many times is a lot of your relievers at the University of Miami were starters in high school. They don't have the ability. They don't understand how to pitch with runners on base just yet. They haven't been in a lot of, you know, ugly innings, a lot of, you know, the clogging of the bases, runners on first and second, one out. You know, guys are trying to hit the ball the other way, bunt situation. So bring in relievers who are used to that. Bring in relievers who understand, hey, my job is to get five outs. My team may be down two runs, but if I keep the game at two right here, we have a chance. Those are the kinds of roles that we filled this this offseason. And I think, you know, again, if you're emulating what's going on at the professional level, the professional level is usually 14 guys that look a lot of the same, right? They can pitch the fifth and sixth, and they can also pitch the eighth and the ninth because their stuff is that good. So, again, you you ra they're raising the floor of their bullpen. Your fifth inning guy might be a guy who could pitch the eighth and ninth this year for the University of Miami. So, again, I think they did a tremendous job addressing the middle relief now. Let's go figure out who those starters are and what the back end of that bullpen is. A lot of moving pieces, a lot of stuff that needs to be figured out this fall. Yeah, just real quick, one name you mentioned before we get into Adrian Del Castillo here that has been a podcast favorite, guy we've talked about. You broke him down. Uh, Griffin Hugus, two-way player at Cincinnati, local kid from Palm Beach, goes up to Cincinnati as a shortstop slash pitcher, really athletic kid, does some nice things, but now is switching exclusively to pitcher. Miami my, my identified him as a guy with some upside, brought him in goes to the Cape, and D1 Baseball identified him as one of the absolute best pitchers in the Cape and as a potential day two guy, noting he's 6'3", super impressive, um, played well in the championship game, hit the ball well, three pitches in the zone, eight, 83 to 85 mile an hour changeup, 90 to 94 mile an hour fastball that he gets swing and miss in the zone and fills up the zone, can change shape on his breaking ball, something you talk about a lot. He's got the slider and the sweeper, and then also can – put a little hump with a curveball at 76, 77 in the stats, 2-0, 2.31 ERA, 23 innings pitched, four walks, 24 strikeouts. So again, we saw some tough, tough, tough outings from a, a walk standpoint, hit by pitch standpoint. So you like to see that kind of control and athleticism uh, on the mound. So exciting guy. Maybe he's one of these relievers. Maybe we got three relievers starting on the weekend. Yeah, look, and, and it's not to say that, you know, Miami might be a team that relies less on starting pitching and has more in the bullpen, right? I mean, again, this is what the fall is for. You got to, first of all, again, I think the most important thing before games start, build the culture, build the team chemistry. Once the game starts, like, hey, let's start evaluating what we actually have here. How are we going to get 27 outs from a pitching standpoint? Is it going to be heavily relying on our bullpen, what we see at the major league level? Are we have or do we have some frontline starters that maybe just don't stand out right now? And you don't find that out until you know the bullets start flying and you start playing those nine inning scrimmages. Yeah, switching gears here to um, a former Kane who has taken Major League Baseball by storm, not just with Miami fans, but he's got really the whole league talking about him. That is Adrian Del Castillo, uh, Miami native, goes to UN, tore it up as a freshman, then gets drafted in the second round after his third year. 36 at pets. So we're talking about limited sample size, but hitting 361, 425 on base, 66 7 slug, three home runs, 1.092 OPS. Did a grand slam against the Marlins, had a walk off his first game, I believe. They got a flair for the dramatic, certainly 
uh, early on in his career with that sweet lefty swing. A friend of mine who is a, a major league scout who knows Del Castillo extremely well compared him to the switch hitter for the Indians and Tigers back in the day, Victor Martinez, a guy that was just an unbelievable hitting catcher who could also play DH. Maybe not you know defense first, but he could play catcher credibly and then had the ability to play DH when necessary because his bat was so good. So you've watched this guy since he came on the scene. What what can you tell me about it about Adrian Del Castillo? Well, I, th- I think if you're you're a Kane fan and you haven't seen the videos of him, you know, hitting the grand slam in his first at bat back in Marlins Park, that was incredible. This is a guy who the only way you can probably upstage your first home run, which was a walk-off home run was to hit a grand slam at home in front of your family, which was so cool to see and had six RBIs that night. He had, he went two for three last night in the final game of the series. So this is, this is a guy who is making it look easy his first week and a half in the major league. So it, it, it's so cool to see. And Adrian was one of those guys that as a freshman, he was similar to Kube was a focal point of a lineup, right? He was thrust right in there batting third from day one, understood the assignment, understood that, Hey, Teams are going to pitch me differently, had a tremendous freshman campaign. Unfortunately, his sophomore year was shortened because of COVID. But, you know, this this guy's a tremendous talent. Um, Obviously, the the hitting is a little bit ahead of the catching right now, but he plays a premium position, a position that Miami has been trying to fill since he left, right? A big void that he left um, in 2021. We haven't had a catcher quite like Adrian, you know, in the last three seasons. But Look, I think as, as a former player, as, as a Hurricane fan, first and foremost, you root for him. It's been a, a tremendous ride thus far. I think the fact that he had such a big following at Marlins Park. I saw, you know, J.D. was throwing out the first pitch yesterday. He took a picture with John Jay. I think a bunch of the, the, the current players were at the game on the field beforehand. So very cool to see. I think it just speaks to, hey, the path line to, you know, to the pros is, is through the University of Miami, right? This guy's two and a half years removed from being drafted, and he's – going to be an everyday guy on a, on a pennant chasing Diamondbacks team. So look, I, I think, you know, we talk about college baseball, the development standpoint, this guy spent no time in the minors. He was going to be the triple A player of the year this year, right. As one of the younger trip guys in triple A that, that we had seen, you know, throughout the season. So awesome moment for him. Awesome moment for his family. Um, Adrian's a, a tremendous, you know, ambassador for the U. And I think it, it's a, it's a great sort of pathway. You're, you're getting all these guys on campus what a perfect time to have them go watch, you know, one someone they could see themselves and someone they can put their, you know, understand like, hey, this guy was in my shoes two and a half years ago. And look, Miami becoming, I don't say catcher you, but they're producing some catchers for the pros. When you talk about Yasmani Grandel back in the day, of course, you go all the way back to Charles Johnson. But Zach Collins, I know, wasn't the, the career he's expected so far, but he's a, he's a pro. And then now Del Castillo. Hope to get some of that back. Get a defensive catcher in Tanner Smith, a uh, couple true freshmen in Evan Tavares, Nolan Johnson. Be nice to get that position cranked up again because it does seem like Miami. You know, there's not there's only so many pro catchers out there, right? So Miami's right. had a decent chunk of them. Yeah, no, and, and it's it's a position of 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 tremendous need on on any baseball team, right? And I think Miami's done a great job putting them in the pros. Del Castillo is just the next in line. And again, like I mentioned, it's it's a cool moment, a teachable moment to have all your freshman class, your transfer guys come in and have Adrian Del Castillo walk through the door and, and have the series that he did uh, against the Marlins. Real quick before I let you go, put your scouting hat on. You used to sit, I know you where you sit, right behind right behind the catcher. Do you see Del Castillo as a long-term catcher where he's playing? I mean, because obviously this is a, a cup of coffee, a whole season, stacking whole seasons at catcher, or do you see him as someone who eventually transitions into the field or just as a DH? You know, I, I think it's it's a it's the question that that it's on everyone's mind. Right? I'm sure if you're in the Diamondbacks front office, you're trying to evaluate can he move around and play other positions. I mean, I when I saw him at the University of Miami, I certainly think he's athletic enough to play other positions. If he doesn't stick at catcher, catcher is such a grueling position for you know the, the entirety of a season. If you can stick back there and catch you know 120, 125 games like the JT Real Mutos of the world and put up good offensive numbers, the sky's the limit. Again. From a health standpoint, I'm sure the Diamondbacks want a bat like Adrian Del Castillo to mat, to you know pair with a Corbin Carroll, to pair with a Cattell Marte. All these left-handed bats, you want to get as much out of him as you possibly can. But you know, in, in my opinion, I think Adrian's a worker. I know his work ethic. I know the type of person that he is. He's going to want to be a catcher. He's going to want to play back there. He's going to want to be a tremendous defensive catcher. Right now, I would say the catching is probably lagging a little bit behind the hitting. But you know, I, I know that the type of person that he is, he's going to put in the work and and try and come into spring training next year and be the number one catcher on that roster. Yeah, look, when you're a lefty uh, slugging 6-6-7, six, six, they'll 
they'll find a spot for you. On oh the yeah. Yeah. But hey, Javi, appreciate you. Excited. We got stuff to talk. We were talking about portal for a while and recruiting and draft. Now we got players in uniform. We will keep the coverage going again. Subscribe to the bullpen mafia. If you're not already that Don Stroll interview was unbelievable. You had, him, you had him really telling stories that, that Josh Beckett thing. That's a chills that over any Marlins fan's spine here in that story. Plenty more on the bullpen mafia podcast. So if you're listening to this, obviously you're a baseball fan, college pro high school, just general banter bullpen mafia. Check him out. Of course, like and subscribe right here. Javi appreciate you. Thanks. T. Go Canes. Go Canes.